I don't know about you guys, but that's a lot of money. I mean, you know, I'm definitely never going to see a trillion dollars in my lifetime. Although, did, did you read Bill Gates is on track to be the world's first trillionaire? I don't know if anyone saw that. Like, he's, I don't know what you're going to do with that amount of money, but good luck to him. Um, but we are talking about really large figures. And it, I suppose it is useful to put that into some sense of... Um, some sense of comparison, um, but just give it some sense of scale of the numbers that we talk about. Because it's easy to talk about millions and billions, but what does it actually mean? Um, so moving into the regulation, we're going to step through um, not a basic financial instrument now, because we did that a few weeks ago, but we're going to first look at a compound financial instrument. But to get to that point, we're just going to review a couple of the definitions that we saw a few weeks back, just to jog memories, because I know it's been a little while. So a financial instrument is any contract that gives rise to a financial asset of one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument of another. So the important part of that is there is a contractual arrangement. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that what, if the contract says these are shares, it has to be equity because we're actually still looking at the substance of the contract. But what we're looking at is the fact that there is a contract in existence. So a financial asset is any asset that is cash, an equity instrument of another entity. So if you have shares in BHP, for example, that's a financial asset for you. Um, a contractual right to receive cash or another financial asset from somebody else. So that is an account receivable, for example. Um, this we will look at the next one we will look at today. So this idea that you can exchange a financial, ad financial asset or financial liability with another entity under conditions that are potentially favorable to you. So if you're in a situation where there is some sort of exchange going on, and we'll see examples of that, where you've got an exchange going on and you are on the positive side of things, so you're in a situation where you're, you're on, the, on the favorable side of things, that is a financial asset for you. And we'll, we'll come across an example of that. Or a contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instruments. A financial liability is any liability that is a contractual obligation. So it's, again, this idea of contracts become important. To deliver cash for another financial asset, so you've got some sort of payable, or to exchange financial assets or liabilities with another entity under conditions that are potentially unfavorable. So it is just the reverse of what we saw in the previous slide. In this case, we have some sort of exchange set up, but we're the party that's actually in a sense, out of the money. We're the ones that are not in a good position. And if that's the case, you pick up a financial liability. Um, or it's a contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instruments. An equity instrument is any contract that evidences a residual interest in the assets of an entity after deducting all of its liabilities. Um, and this becomes important when we look at a compound financial instrument because you, an instrument just doesn't have to be pure liability, it could be a mix of the two, it could be just pure equity. Um, but what we see here is really similar to this notion of how equity gets defined from a framework point of view. Because what equity is from the framework perspective is basically what is left over after all the, uh, what is left over of the company's assets after you've paid out the liabilities that the company has. And if you think about what just business is about, that makes a lot of sense. If you start up a business and you put in some money, your own money into it, the business buys various things, makes money, does whatever it is, the business is all these assets that's sitting there, that are sitting there. Then if you have incurred liabilities, your stake in that business is what is left over of those assets after you've paid off all the people that you owe. So you have that residual interest in the business. And so when we see a financial instrument that has a liability component the equity part of it is just what's left over once we've dealt with the liability section. And when we see a compound instrument, we'll see how that works, which is what we're about to have a look at. Uh, so quickly, the classification of financial instruments. So the issuer of a financial instrument shall classify the instrument on initial recognition. And that is done in accordance with the substance of the contractual arrangement. So just because you issue something and you call it equity doesn't necessarily make it so. You've got to have a look at what 
the substance is. Does it look like a financial liability? Is there a contractual, is there a contractual obligation to pay some sort of financial asset? If there is, it's probably a financial liability. So actually looking at the substance is important. So it's an economic idea, not a legal idea. Um, so the substance and then also looking at the, li the definitions of what a liability is, an asset is, and an equity, and an equity instrument. The issue of a non-derivative financial instrument, a, assuming there's a word missing there, shall evaluate the terms of the financial instrument to determine whether it contains both a liability and an equity component. Such components shall be classified separately. So you split it up. If you issue something which is a compound instrument, you don't just show it all as liability and then change it all to equity if they convert. You need to actually split these two things up and show the liability and the equity components. So, a compound or a convertible bond. Now, so this is actually from the standard. So they give you this definition. So if you've got the standards with you, paragraph 29, actually this is an example they use. So a bond convertible by the holder into a fixed number of ordinary shares of the entity is a compound financial instrument. So for most of this topic, for those that are doing finance or you know, finance majors, a lot of what we talk about may be a little bit easier than those that aren't doing finance, but that's okay because we will try to explain it in a way that makes, gets everyone on the same page. So what actually is this? So before we get to the lecture demonstration, let's just imagine I have what we did from week six, but we'll simplify what we did from week six. So a bond or a debenture is basically like a, big, a giant IOU. So I need to borrow some money, so I'll write just basically, not on a piece of paper, it'd be, but let's just for imagine, on a piece of paper just saying, you know, the holder of this, in two years time or three years time, whenever it is, I will pay you what's on the face of this. And I'll put down, you know, so it's a face of a million dollars, this is, it's a no coupon bond, so there's no regular payments, it's just I will give you, whoever holds this, one million dollars in two years time. Now, you're not going to pay a million dollars for it now because obviously you're going to be out of the money doing that. But let's say I need someone to buy this from me. And I know, it's been a tough week at work. So I just need a volunteer to basically take a piece of paper from me. That's not an onerous thing. Sorry, what's your name? Emma. Emma. So Emma has bought this from me. We don't know, let's just say she's bought it for $800,000. So she's paid me $800,000. In two years time, if this was a, just a straight liability, not, not a convertible bond, in two years time, I will give Emma a million dollars. And that's all that happens. If it's a convertible bond, that $1 million, that face still exists. So at two years time, I could, like, I'm meant to give you a million dollars, but it also comes with this conversion option attached. So, and this is up to Emma to make a decision on this. Now, what Emma's choice is in, let's just say you can only exercise it in two years, and that's not always gonna be the case, but let's just say it only is allowed to be exercised at the very end. You get the choice then to say, do I want to get the million dollars in cash from me or would I like to convert that instrument into equity in my business? Now, that's a choice you get to make and that's an option, that's the option that you have. Um, so what that effectively is is an equity instrument because what you have then is a call option giving you the right for a specified period of time. So we've just made it really tight specified period of time just at the end to convert that bond into a fixed number of ordinary shares. Now, because that's an additional component, you're gonna pay more for this instrument than the 800,000. You might pay 825,000. And what we've effectively done is, if we can value the liability and the cash flows, and, we can, and there's a way we can do that, we know the liability component is the 800, and because you paid 825, we know that residual component is the equity component, and that's what's classified as the equity. And we've got 800 of liability, 25 of equity, and that's all we have to do. So, thank you. That wasn't, that wasn't too hard. It was, just had to hold a piece of paper for 30 seconds. What we're gonna have a look at now is 
Actually, just a couple of quick slides before we do um, have a look at the question. So initial recognition, you recognize a financial liability in the statement of financial position when and only when you become a party. So that's when Emma bought the instrument. That's when we recognize it. You recognize it, um, so we're talking about the liability component. You classify it in accordance with various paragraphs. At initial recognition, you measure it at fair value. Now that's, in this case, not what Emma paid for the instrument because the instrument wasn't just liability. The instrument was liability and equity. So we can't just go off what she paid for it. We've got to look at what the liability component was worth. Uh, in terms of classification, we are going to use subsequently measured at amortized costs for this because that's, for what we're doing, that's generally how we'll see it get done. Um, and the effective interest method is looking at the amortized cost of the instrument and if you were preparing, and you guys actually did fairly well on that debenture question in the exam, so mo for most of you, you're pretty well aware of that. That's what we're going to be doing again. 